halfway through the Habs season. How do they look? Inconsistent? Maybe. Can they ever win outside of regulation? Probably not. Let's look at the Canadians halfway through this season. We'll even talk about maybe who they should get at the deadline and how every player on this squad has been playing so far. 29 games in. Though your Montreal Canadiens, the team we all know and love, are currently fourth in the North Division behind the Oilers, the Jets, the Leafs lead the way. The Canadiens, 29 games played, they are 13 wins, 8 losses in regulation, which is actually the least in the division. What stings them though, 8 Losses in the overtime slash the shootout. The only team in the league that has not won outside of regulation. And those are eight points the Canadians have let slip through their fingers. Leading the way in the North Division, the Toronto Maple Leafs. They sit with 40 points. 38 second and third for the Jets and the Oilers. The Oilers, though, have played three games more than the Jets. The Canadians in fourth are 29 games played. That's right, three games in hand over the Edmonton Oilers. Four points behind Edmonton and Winnipeg or Montreal. So... Let's just say half of Montreal's losses in overtime, you get half of those wins. You are right in there with the Jets and the Oilers breathing down the Leafs' decks and right there with Winnipeg. And you don't have the Calgary Flames, who are still kind of figuring their subs out, and the Canucks, who all of a sudden, led by Thatcher Demko, are leading the way trying to get back into this playoff race. If the Canadians knew what they were doing in three-on-three, they'd be in a much different position right now. And that is due to the, even with considering the inconsistencies down the middle with their young centermen, um, the sort of lack of the left defense we're now seeing with Ben Sherrod out for it looks like six weeks, according to Mark Bergevin, and the issues in net with Carey Price, it is actually really looking at it, the overtimes that have really messed up the Canadians this season. This was, again, on display last night's game between Montreal and Winnipeg, where the Habs actually came back with a rousing third period down 3-1. Brendan Gallagher and Tyler Toffoli leading the way. Tyler Toffoli has, in my opinion, been the MVP for this team so far this season. Uh, but then in overtime, for some reason, for not the first, not the second, I feel like it's at least the third time this year, or at least under Dominic Ducharme alone, Phil Deneau starts the overtime. Jeff Petrie with him. You'll love to see it. Great player. We'll talk about him a little later. And Paul Byron. And there was one good chance, which for the way half of these overtimes have gone for Montreal, was pretty damn good. Except Petrie gets caught. A weird line change leads to an odd man rush. And Nick Ehlers, who was having a fantastic year for the Jets, ends up winning the game for them getting another pass carry price. Thank God at least it wasn't Kyle Connor because he has been lighting up 31 for Montreal and I can't stand it. Though it's actually in last night's game that we can also have another sort of look of what's wrong with Montreal's season. Zone entries, or should I say zone exits through entries have been a massive concern for Montreal and those led bad zone exits to two, two of Winnipeg's goals last night, including just oh, like under a minute into the game. And you kind of get an idea that when you look at the defense now, without Ben Chirot, the top pairing was Weber and Edmondson, Petrie and Kulak, and then Romanov and Xavier Ouellette, who I don't think should be an NHL or on any team right now. Don't, no disrespect, but um, he did not look great last night. He has not looked great in the two games he has played for the Habs this season. Even going back to the bubble over, not the summer, Jesus, <laughs> um, looking at it in, in autumn, late summer, God, when was the bubble? <laughs> he didn't look good either, that's what I'm trying to say. Now, earlier this week, Mark Bergman did have a press conference where he said he didn't plan on boosting Montreal's defense at the same time, because of the flat cap, it's a little difficult to make trades. We all know that, but if we're looking around the North Division, the Leafs apparently are looking to add another forward, and the Jets are very interested in Matias Ekholm. Now, if we say, for example, the Leafs add a, I think it's more likely that they probably get a guy like Kyle Palmieri or, let's say, Mikhail Granlin, but let's say they swing for the fences and they get, like, Philip Forsberg, and Ekholm ends up in the Jets. If the Habs don't do anything to address their defense let alone like winning a round in the playoffs. Compared to the Jets and the Leafs, they might not even make it if they don't make any additions. And there is a player I'm looking at specifically, but I'm gonna wait a little until the end of the video. It's what we call a tease in the business to talk about who I think they should be looking at. But it is a defenseman. He is right-handed, can play the left side, and just finish. There you go. So looking at, I'm gonna look at how every player has been, or I'm gonna rank every player 
in the category of A, a B, a C, a D, and an F. Forget about E's, no one likes E's. Get out of here. We'll start at the bottom with the F's. There are only two players I have under the F category. Uh, and it may be a little unfair, but I have Xavier Ouellette and Victor Mete. I do not know what Victor Mete's standing is with the Canadians, but it is not good. We know he requested a trade earlier in the year. And the fact that Xavier Ouellette has been getting in the line of the past few games over Victor Mete, I think is going to speak volumes of his relationship with the coach. And uh, again, even when he has played, yeah, he can move the puck. But I think we've started to see a bit of a, a, a wall when it comes to his real offensive production. It's great you can skate, but I don't think his passing has become anything really special. Uh, maybe another team can see that and think we maybe we can get something out of that guy. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Victor Mete. Just, I don't see it anymore in the future. Uh, especially Alexander Romanov stole his job the moment he signed the contract to play in here in more North America. And... I think Victor Mete sees that too. That was probably part of the trade request. But now we have the Ds. These are players I've sort of said are holding the team back. First off, I really like this player. I, I always have big fans of him, got to meet him. Really nice guy. My boy Kool-Aid, Brett Kulak. I love him. I really, really do. It's just, and he's played well with Petrie in the past. And I think he's looked better the past few games. Though his consistency over the first 29 games has really, really been a concern. And I think right now, in a very crazy North Division, they need a more stabilizing guy. I don't hate him as a seventh defenseman, but right now, I just, I, I'm not sure either if he is the guy who should be playing with Romanov. It's such a, you know, his early developmental years, you know what I mean? Next is Thomas Tatar, as someone who's looked better. Actually, I'll put these two guys together. They were reunited a bit last night on the third line especially. And you know what? Again, last few games have been turning on, but the entirety of the first half of their season, I've really been disappointed by Phil Deneau and Tomas Tatar. Great goal last night. Wicked snipe. You love to see it from Phil Deneau. At the same time, though, uh, it's just you expect more from a guy who, for a large part of the season, was playing in the top six. He's in the third line now, but only two goals and the contract and that he's sort of looking for and reportedly was turned down. I think it was a six-year, $5 million per. Uh, I don't know if he's going to get $30 million the way he's playing right now. His first half hasn't said that. Neither with Thomas Tatar. His whole thing is he's got to score goals, and he just hasn't scored enough, right? I think... Uh, I think we all expected him to take a seat back for like Anderson to Foley to really get the big minutes, but still sort of maybe pick apart the deeper parts of other teams. I don't think he hasn't really done that. Tough player to kind of put also here in D's Paul Byron. Right now, it just feels like Hap stands for a very weird relationship with Paul Byron is that no one really likes his contract anymore because I think it's the injuries have caught up with him, and he just doesn't have the scoring ability he, he did. He's almost like a true Lekkonen now, that he'll get all these chances, but he just hasn't been burying um, these sort of opportunities they would have in the past with Paul Byron. And at, at this point, like, a great penalty killer, yeah, but I think we need a bit more of that now, especially with the likes of Lekkonen, and, and another guy we'll talk about a little later in the top six who is a fantastic penalty killer and is scoring a lot. Uh, it's a shame because it feels like right now Paul Byron with that contract is a bit of an anchor for the team. And I hate that. Again, who doesn't love Lord Byron? He's got the A on his jersey for a reason. Finally, for the D is I'm putting these guys together because they have been a pairing all year until Sherratt was hurt. It's Ben Sherratt and Shea Weber. They have just not been a great pairing this season. Sherratt has not looked as he did last year. And listen... I do not think of Ben Sherratt as the best offensive defenseman to lead the rush, make plays, pinch. I don't like it. Um, yeah, he had nine goals last year, but this, it just hasn't been it. I want someone more flee the foot on that pairing with Weber, who himself has been turned over City. Not been great at Shea Weber. That's been very, very quiet to Habs fans, by the way. Uh, no one wants to admit it, but maybe it's time for Weber to really take a back seat and especially maybe take off the power play. I get the big shot, but I think maybe there's better room to maybe try and bring in another puck-moving defenseman we'll talk about later. Ah, but they just need to be better. Okay, then we have C. These are good players, but you expect more from them. 
And first, because he's just so difficult to talk about, I love this player, Swiss Army Knife type guy, play in all situations, four checks like a monster, but like Paul Byron, just cannot seem to bury the opportunities, and that's our Churi Lekkinen. And I'm worried about Lekkinen because he hasn't played a lot since Dom Ducharme took over, which I am not a fan of. Claude Julien scratched Lekkinen a few times because he didn't like his offensive output, but his defensive game is just so valuable. And if they're just going to bench him, you might as well trade him. His salary can be used for a bit of room to bring in a, a different player that you're actually going to use for the back half of the season. I don't want them to get rid of Lekkinen. I like him as a player, but at the same time, it seems to be on this team, he needs to bury more chances. I don't think he scored since... God, it feels like uh, January? It really feels like a while since Lekkinen's actually went and scored a goal. Not January, sorry. His last goal from NHL.com. I was close. February 1st versus the Vancouver Canucks. He had an assist too. Great night, but... That was a long time ago, <laughs> especially in the shortened season, right? Next, I'm putting these two together because Nick Suzuki and Jesper Kakinemi have sort of taken turns when they've been great. Suzuki was point per game for the first 12 of the season. Jesper Kakinemi has been turning it on lately, even got a shot on the first line with Gallagher into Foley. Now Suzuki's in that spot. What the Canadians need looking to the next half of the season is those guys to be in tandem scoring at the same time because those are the real important pieces here in Montreal. Toffoli can score all he wants, Josh Anderson at the same time, Price making all the saves and Allen at the same time, but if those two can't really take the step forward, and it's not like this is a, a surprise that maybe they're not going to win any face-offs. I talked about that at the beginning of the year or that Suzuki may be struggling. There's that pattern of a, you know, a second year player, but you know what, for this team, they have to start scoring. And you know, right now, like, yeah, they've been good. And as the category says, they gotta be better though. Same with Jake Evans. Uh, I mean, you want, you want more offense from that guy. Um, scored some shorties to start the season, but since then, I mean, he wins his puck battles. He's a fine fourth line center, but again, you need, I think his offensive numbers are the same as Nate Thompson was last year. But it's just, you know, it's really funny. In last night's game versus the Jets, there was an offensive zone faceoff between Nate Thompson and Jake Evans. And I remember last season when Evans had been called up and he was doing faceoff work with Nate Thompson, and he just couldn't beat him. And it was just, you know, it's that thing with young centermen. They just they need time to win faceoffs. And faceoffs with possession, I mean, we saw Gallagher's goal last night was on a face-off, and it's just something that the kids got to get used to. And it was just in that moment, Thompson won that face-off in the game last night, and it was just sort of like, oh, wow. Yeah, maybe a depth centerman who, you know, like a Luke Glendenny who wins a lot of face-offs would probably help. But, uh, again, nothing too bad about Evans. Uh, Alexander Romanov, I feel like, hasn't really gotten much of a chance as I kind of hoped he would lately. Why he has not gotten a chance on three on three overtime? The guy, the risks he takes, just the flair in his game, he would do wonders. I mean, I'm not saying play him over Jeff Petrie, but I mean, like, I think there was a time Ben Chirot saw the, the ice on three on three. Weber, too? No. No, 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 no. No! Finally, in C, I have Carey Price. Um, listen. His numbers, last month were at a below 900. He's made his way up to a 907. Since the Stefan Waite fire and Carey Price has been lights out. Up there with the best goalies in the league. Maybe Thatcher Demko has the edge there. But Carey, even in the beginning of the season when he was struggling, there still were games that he was the reason they got points. And even in this stretch where he has been good again, he's been lights out. So I can't quite say he's a D in holding, you know, the team back lately. And not just lately, sorry, because I made that very clear. It's not just recent bias here, but there were signs at the beginning of the season. And I think those games early on, as well as the stretch of the past five games, which in the long season is nothing, but do mean something in the shortened season, with a goalie, I think he deserves to be a C. With Carey Price, people are either the highest of the high or the lowest of the low. So I think it is fair to rank him in the C. That, and am I biased because he's my favorite player of all time? Yes. I'm trying, though. Okay, the Bs. There's nothing wrong with a B. You're good. You're one of the best players on the team. It's just A is just... A is just another level. So the B players, don't take this wrong, anyone who's a B. The first B is Brendan Gallagher. There's nothing wrong with Brendan Gallagher. He's doing great with less ice time since Ducharme took over, which is a bit like 
okay? For, it's Brendan Gallagher, but he's doing, he's doing it. He's doing great. And it's just, uh, do I need to explain what Brendan Gallagher does well? He just work, works harder with, than, than anyone else on the team. Brendan Gallagher. That's it. Another B is, and this guy is really a B plus. Like, I love this play. It's Jonathan Drew. It's good old Jonathan. If, if he had more than two goals, it would definitely be an A. And you're probably saying, Adam, Phil Deneau only has two goals. Why is, why is he not doing great on this list? Jonathan Drew leads this, this team in assists and has just been a completely different player this season. I, I love to see it. He, I really wanted to put him in A, but he's got to be in B because there's just not enough goal. Like, his shooting percentage, I think, is 4%. I have it up right in front of me, actually. 4.3% is his shooting percentage, so he should be getting some goals sooner rather than later. Another B, Joss Anderson. I love Joss Anderson. The power horse, as he's been called. Just a Big, burly man you hate to play against, always ready to play. You love it. Finally, in the Bs, I I put Joel Edmondson in B. B. I mean, listen, plus minus doesn't really mean anything, but he's leading the league in plus minus. I mean, we got to give credit to Big Joel, right? I mean, he's he hasn't been noticeable, which is good for the game he plays. He's a part of that to do that he plays with Jeff Petrie, probably. But, listen... There's a saying that you can own, the best you can do is beat the teams in front of you. Joe Edmondson has not been a liability, and I think he has excelled at his his at not being noticeable. Is this a stretch? Come on, Joe Edmondson, let's let's give him some love. No one else gives him love. We just we like Joe Edmondson. Yeah, we like him. Okay, the A's, the the the, the best players for the team this season. First is Jake Allen. He hasn't played in a little bit now, but he's played ten games for the Canadians so far. Gives him a chance every night that he's played, and he's a 922 save percentage, which in a normal year could get your Vesna votes if you played enough games. And in the North Division, that's like, man, that's great, because there's no defense in this division. Like, let's be honest here. Next is, is a weird one. I did, the value of his contract, just how sneaky good he is, how much of a pest he is, I just, it felt right giving Corey Perry an A. <laughs> it's so weird. I, st I still kind of get, like, is that is really Corey Perry on this team? But the way he plays, even in this late stage where he's not the 50-goal guy he used to be, you can still see it, though. You can see what made him made him good. The what do you want me to say? He's just good, and he makes $700,000, and he's just made all these great little plays in tight. He's worked on the power play really well. He had an amazing pass last night to uh, set up the game tying goal for Tyler Toffoli. Just a really, really good... And you know what? That's another A player is Tyler Toffoli. He's leading this team 27 points in 29 games played. He's second in goal scoring in the league behind Austin Matthews. 18 goals has Tyler Toffoli. He has been so much... So worth it. Thank you, Jim Benning. Thank you. $4.2 million for this player. Oh, he's just been so good. He's come as advertised... He's the mystery penalty killer I was talking about earlier. He is a force shorthanded. I love it. He's such a joy to watch. It's a position I thought Josh Anderson may have played, but Tyler Toffoli, I mean, what a great player. Now, his shooting percentage is up at 19, which is not, you know, that's going to go down a bit. That's going to go down. Maybe, you know, I, he's not going to score like 40 goals, but honestly, I think he could crack 30. I don't think that's beyond the realm of possibility if he gets hot again. I mean... Why not? Finally, the last A, Jeff Petrie. 25 points in 29 games played as a defenseman. 11 goals! He has been so incredible this season. Has really taken the spot as the defenseman go-to for this, this team. He is leading the charge, and every time he has the puck, you know something good is going to happen for this team. All right, to finish off here, I want to talk about a player that I really think Montreal, I'm finally talking about it, should get at the deadline. The first priority, I think, is they need a defenseman, and it needs to be someone who can move the puck, especially who is good at zone exits, and could probably take Shea Weber's spot on the second slash first, the lesser power play unit with Toffoli in that, right? It's Sammy Vatnin, okay? One year, two million dollars. Now, Montreal's cap situation is a bit messy, so there is a risk involved here because of the two-week quarantine. So... You can either send a forward the other way. Now, 
the Devils are a very young team, with the exception of Travis Zajac and Kyle Palmieri. The only guys, I think, on that team who are over 30 years old. So would they take a guy like Arturi Lekkinen? That would help the salary. If you were to send a Brett Kulak, that would hurt your defense, and you probably have Ouellette and Mete in for those two weeks. And there would have to be some salary retention. But then again, the Montreal Canadiens have so many draft picks that it wouldn't matter. You could make up the value. Now, Kulak does make $2 million in salary with this contract. Next season, he'll be a UFA. Um, and teams aren't crazy on paying a lot of money right now. At the same time, though, the Jets, um, not the Jets, the Devils don't really have a lot of players to pay. They don't really have a lot of money invested on players. So... You could do it. Or again, Lekkinen, I don't want to trade him, but you have to give something up to get a good player. And he's not playing right now, so it's not going to affect the team. Again, I, I don't want it. Maybe instead you send out Yol Armia, who I just realized I forgot to talk about, by the way, in the rankings. Yol Armia, quickly, by the way, he's a C, could be better. Season got messed up when Myers gave him a concussion. No suspension, of course, but Yol Armia, he's, he's all right. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Vatnin. Anyway, so back to him. Uh, yeah, I would put him, if ideally, these are how I would look at the defensive pairings. When Ben Sherratt is back, of course, I'd actually put him as the third line guy and just let him be a defensive dude and let Romanov go do his fun, exciting, skatey defenseman stuff. That wasn't the best hockey language ever, but you know what I mean. Petrie Edmondson stay together, there's been nothing wrong. And then on the top pairing, or would really be the second pairing because Weber's behind Petrie now, let's be honest, it's Weber and Vatnin. Again, yeah, Vatnin's a right-handed defenseman, but he can play the left side, always has. And then each pairing, Weber, Sherratt, Edmondson, you have the stay-at-home guy, and then you have Romanov, Petrie, Vatnin, guys who could join the rush and maybe help with the offense, something this team really needs. Again, if they stick with this roster and the Jets and the Leafs make additions, Montreal really, 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 really need to... Listen, they have enough prospects. We all know that. It's time to use the picks to improve the team you have in front of you now, Mark Bergevin. Every, every year, every year is, oh, the Canadians have all of these assets and that. They're going to make a big rude move to improve the roster, and Bergevin never does it. He has never traded the first-round pick since he's been GM of Montreal since 2012. They have two seconds, like three thirds, a bunch of picks. Use them to improve the team, Burge. Because if we go back to the normal Atlantic next year and the Canadians are in the same division as Tampa, Boston, Toronto, Florida are good again, or good for the first time, really, can this Habs roster, the way it is right now, compete with those guys? I don't know. So this year may be their best chance for a little while. Anyway. Um, maybe I'm missing a player that you would like to see the Canadians get. Why not let me know in the comments below? Let me know who's your MVP for the Habs. Who's your most improved player? Mine's Jonathan Drouin, by the way. And, yeah. Where do you see the Canadians stacking up if they can... For the rest of the season, do you think they still make it? Do they catch the Oilers? Do the Flames make it? How do the Canucks do? I'd really, really like to know. Anyway, I will see you all... Eventually? I don't know. Maybe the Habs are going to make a big trade and I can talk about that. Goodbye.